Yeah, likable science. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And we're going to look at Burke Hold area, uh, Suda, Suda Malai. And, um, you know, there's very little that, that uh, we know about that. Um, but I tell you the truth, I think about it all the time. Do you think about it all the time, Ethan? You're a scientist. You're supposed to be thinking about these things. Well, just uh, just read the uh, interesting piece about they've now discovered it in uh, the soil in the U.S., which uh, Mississippi, some, Mississippi, wasn't it? The Gulf Coast, yeah. That took some people by surprise. So uh, that, that that made me think a little bit about it. Well, you know, I mean, from a point of view of just sort of mm, zoning zoning in on this. You know, we have so many scary diseases now we are finding. And query whether it's because they existed before or whether they are part of the flat world, you know, the interconnected world. And uh, humanity touches each, uh, each other and, uh, you know, it, it, and our biome, our, our global biome is changing. And maybe also you have to say that over time, uh, climate change is changing the, the global environment, therefore, and therefore the global biome, and these things are, are coming around. It's hard to say how long this existed, but it's certainly um, at top of mind for a lot of scientists in the United States right now. So what is it, and um, where is it, and how threatening is it? So it, it's interesting, Jay. It, it's, it's, in a sense, it's not very trendy, you know? That is, for really the last number of decades, the big diseases that we've worried about from AIDS to Ebola to MERS to SARS and COVID are all zoonotic. That is, they've been transmitted to us from some animal host. Basically, they, they jump from animals to people. And th those are all viral diseases. Melanosis is a bacterial disease. As you mentioned, it was a bacterium that caused it. And it just lives in the soil, basically. Um, so you can pick it up from ground, from water. Um, and so it, it is, you know, it's sort of not following the trends, although, uh, yes, why, why and how it showed up in the U.S. is a little puzzling. Uh, it may have been there all along. It, it's generally distributed around the tropics, moist tropical areas, and yes, it's getting a little warmer these days, so it probably is moving around, moving a little bit north in, in an area where there's enough moisture. You know? Yeah. Well, it seems to have started out, at least in terms of the number of cases in Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, right. I find interesting. And, it, and it's in the dust in the soil. So if you had, hmm, how about this? If you had an area that was uh, being changed in the way the soil works by climate change, like a drought, and drought is hitting a lot of places, including Europe right now, um, where you have the dust coming off the soil, right? It's that dust that gets into your lungs and starts affecting a number of your organs. Um, you know, your lungs to start, but the, the liver, the spleen, I'm sure there's other ones too, that get affected by this bacteria. Um, and, um, you know, I suspect that if you went and looked at the number of cases, you would find it increase in the cases identified anyway. Um, and I think you would look at, um, you know, the dust as the primary thing, but it's, as you say, it's also in the water. And you're, you're a water scientist, so I wonder if you can speak to that. Um, what, what's, the, what's the connection between the dust and the water? Well, that is, this bacterium is not typically associated with real dry desert-like climate. That is, you don't, you're not seeing it from the countries in, in Saharan Africa, particularly, um, but you're seeing it from more of the, the moist areas. So, um, it apparently doesn't do too well in really dry areas. Now, likely, as with many bacteria, likely can survive drying out for some period of time. It will sort of go into a spore state and wait until it's moist again before coming sort of back to life. Um, I don't know how well it lists, how well it lives that way, how long. Um, but you know, as our climate gets warmer, there's also more more moisture in the atmosphere, which means a lot of places are getting more rain, um, and it may bring back. But meanwhile, when it, if it gets dried out and lifted up in dust, then it can blow anywhere around the planet, right? Well, then, you know, there was a piece about Thailand. That, you know, a lot of the scientists and uh, universities in Thailand are working on this. They probably have a higher incident of it there. 
And they have found that in rainy spells where it's raining, monsoon, you know, monsoon weather, uh, the number of cases goes up. So you're right. Yeah. It's the it's the water in the air, and maybe it stays in the dust, and and then somehow when when it gets wet, the dust uh, gives the, gives the bacteria into the water in the air. Uh, yeah, and or I mean, you know, if if you can also pick it up very locally, that is, if if you uh, have a cut on your foot or anything, and you step in a puddle where where if you can start a local infection there, that may stay local. It may, if it gets in your bloodstream, move anywhere else, where, as you say, you can inhale it and get it in your lungs, and from there it can start moving to other organs. It's a very variable disease. The, the onset of symptoms varies in terms, some people will get symptoms about a day after being infected. In other cases, they have found it's been a matter of decades before the person gets infected. Yeah, yeah. Some people but apparently get it and then don't ever really get infected basically they, they get in their systems and have no symptoms at all their, their immune system is good enough to knock it down basically yeah but the customary period is is like a month or something they yeah. could start a, the average one, one day to a month or something yeah and if you get it you know um, the, the, not a lot of doctors know about this right you know it's the old thing where the doctors don't know so they they can't make a differential on it and, and they wind up letting it go or treating it for something else. Exactly. It, its symptoms are so sort of variable and resemble so many other diseases that it, it's, it's, unless you're really looking for it, you're probably not going to find it very quickly. You're going to find it by the process of eliminating a lot of other things, basically. Um, and then you're have... taking a sample, right? Taking a sample, blood sample and the like. Right. Uh, now, or a skin sample. I'm sure that I'm sure there must be now specific tests for it. I don't really know the, the details on that. But um, what you do want to start treating it promptly, and it's not it's not a lightweight treatment. It involves uh, antibiotic injections, I think twice a day for a matter oh, of several weeks. Long time, yeah, then, long time. This is months. not like a regular infection. Yeah, no, this you is have to take a combination good. of of shots of um, you know where they inf infusions. That's right. pretty serious infusion, a, a long term infusion. I mean, hours of infusion. And then later on, you have to follow it up with the oral. Yeah, for, for like two months, three months. Yeah, it's, it's apparently fairly tough to knock it all out. But boy, you, it's the kind of disease that you don't want to let it for a half, you don't want to half knock it out and let it come back because you, you're just, you're, you're giving the disease a, a real break. You're, you're putting evolutionary pressure on it then to develop a drug resistant form, which we don't really, we don't really want to have with this, you know? We've got enough of those evolving anyhow, right? <laughs> well, you know, it it, uh, it points out something that is, that is uh, more and more pronounced in our time, and that is this, is that people have to learn about this. They have to watch this show or other shows, they have to read up on it. By the way, it's called Whitmore's disease, right? That's the, that's the popular name, Whitmore's disease. Easier to um, say, meliodosis, right? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> that really puts it beyond the pale. And, um, you know, to know about it, to know how it presents, to know what the risks are, to know the treatment and the, the course of treatment and so forth, um, really gives you an edge if you wind up getting an infection that looks like this or feels like this, because then you can suggest it to the doctors. And it's, it's, a, it's a thing I've been playing with for a while. You know, watch TV and you get an unending stream of all these high tech medicines. Um, and you, what? What is this? What I should write the name down? What do I have to do? Go to the doctor and, and, and give him a, you know, give him the names, all the names, and there's dozens and dozens of names repeating these ads. And I say this is really BS that you know they do this. The doctor, he's supposed to know. He's supposed to go to school and learn this. Why do I have to learn it? <laughs> and the and, and the answer is, he doesn't necessarily know. Right. And and it is incumbent on the individual citizen to at least know what these diseases are and, and that there is a cure and what the cure is. And it's the same thing with, with um, uh, Whitmore's disease. You know, you really have to know because he may not know. Right. And it used to be pretty easy to guess because you'd find all the cases that would show up in the U.S. were people who had fairly recently traveled to like Southeast Asia somewhere or some at least some moist tropical environment. But then they had a matter of cases, I think in 2020, 2021, with people who hadn't, and they found 
they had all been using some aromatherapy uh, compound in India that apparently had been made with contaminated uh, water, basically. And so they are all essentially, you know, sniffing this bacteria in and they, they find that they quashed that whole batch. They put out an alert on that and basically said, you've got this stuff, throw it away because it's bad for you. But then they had those two cases down in uh, Mississippi, uh, which were, they could trace them to a very different, it was a different um, signature, different genetic makeup. And they then began doing soil samples and found, I think, three samples out of 40 or 90 samples, something like that, that uh, had this bacteria uh, in it. So, yeah. You know, I, I just some thoughts here. Um, it seems to me that um, we have to explain why it got to Mississippi. Uh, there's been no reports of it anywhere else in the U.S., just Mississippi. But it's here. It's been, you know, verified by the University of Mississippi Medical Research uh, Facility. And um, we have to know why. Let me, let me suggest something. Going back to the point that you are a water scientist, I know this, okay? <laughs> Suppose we, we look at, at the climate, okay, all over the world. And we say, well, we got plenty of it going on in Thailand. Um, so what about, you know, this bacteria somehow getting into the water system, uh, being evaporated? I don't know how big the bacteria is. I think it's not very big. And now it's in a cloud somewhere, and the cloud travels. Clouds travel, and they, they travel differently with climate change. And they travel over Mississippi, and, and it rains. And when it rains, the bacteria comes down with the water. Uh, so that, if that's true, I'm really interested in your, your thought about this. If that's true, it could go anywhere, no? Exactly, exactly. Um, I would not be surprised to, to, to find out what that was. You know, I'm sure they're working on tracing it right now and trying to figure out which strain from what part of Southeast Asia it's most like, whether there was, were people or other animals. Other animals can also carry this. Uh, that, that got brought back somehow and could have dropped it into the soil there. Um, because if, 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 as you say, it's spreading through either the dust blowing around or the clouds, then yeah, it could be basically anywhere, including Hawaii, of course. Uh, and unless, again, unless you're looking for it specifically, you're not particularly going to find it, right? You have to be testing for it rather. rather right. have, have see if somebody presents with the possibility and well, you know, it's it's different. It's I mean, difficult um, to find the possibility. It could be you know, could any number of skin infections, right. uh, and you'd have to rule them all out. It's a it's a difficult process to to exclude and find this one. The exactly. other thing is that uh, I remember um, that if you touch somebody who has uh, a sore, uh, you know, a Whitmore disease sore, you're going to get it. So you have to be careful about touching skin of somebody who might have it, right? As I understand, it's not typically past person to person, but yes, if you have close contact with their with their open wounds, for instance, if you're cleaning their open wounds and then don't practice very good hygiene yourself, uh, you, you can easily pick it up, I guess, that way. Um, it's, as I say, it's not, it's not its primary mode of transmission at all, uh, but uh, certainly feasible. Uh, so yeah. I, again, just what you're saying, people need to become aware of it, need to know about it. Doctors probably need to start getting, you know, a little more alert for it, get, get test, uh, specific test kits out to yeah. the whole profession, you know. Uh, they, they, should, they should watch uh, this show. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we know we have the drugs to deal with it. I think that's clear. I, I recall that amoxicillin and doxycillin, um, they're both, you know, standard high tech bacterial, antibacterial, antibiotics, and they, of course, you have to infuse it and then give a course of oral treatment, but they will, um, they, they will cure this disease. Yeah, I saw uh, some others listed, but yeah, there are doubtless different uh, antibacterial agents. You can, you can about use. five of them, yeah. you know, that, that will do this. The other, the other thing that's very troubling, and, and this goes to, um, you know, the whole thing about COVID is that we do not have a vaccine. So if you're going to travel, for example, to Thailand in the monsoon, uh, you may want to think about this. Um, but there's no, there's no vaccine out there. And my guess is that right now, for the lack of identifying 
you know, the, the genetic makeup of this of this bacteria, um, there nobody's working on it. Yeah, uh, that I mean that happened unfortunately with a lot of other medical stuff during COVID, right? It's estimated that quite quite a few people ultimately died from diseases that they shouldn't have because they either weren't going in for their treatments or their you know their medical provider was overwhelmed and not calling them in for some regular checkups or they couldn't get scheduled into to for appropriate uh, surgery or whatever you know because of because of COVID and yeah that sort of wiped pushed everything you know off, off the stage for a couple of years here yeah even uh, uh anthony fauci who's leaving at the end of the year now and and uh you know a most the most interesting quotable quote that came up in reuters today it was a very interesting quote he said would you stick around if you if you were being followed all day um by by uh security federal security agents carrying guns yeah. It's not a happy time. And yeah. I think what he was saying is, well, if you have the guys with the guns following you around, um, you had a real risk out there. And there were people making death threats on him, even now. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, you know, so the, maybe he could help work on a vac vaccine um, for this particular vi uh, a bacteria. That would be helpful. He has nothing to do. He's the kind of guy who sits around and twiddles his thumbs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to talk to you about the the most um, disturbing, threatening thing of all in my reading on it. Uh, I don't know if you caught this, but uh, it, it seems to be a candidate for for um, bioterrorism, and I don't know why it might be, but uh, they have put it in the category of a candidate for bioterrorism. Can you see? Um, you know, modifying this, uh, uh, changing its makeup, um, maybe with uh, CRISPR or something, so that it becomes a, a, a real candidate for bioterrorism? Sure. I mean, that's, that's, I'm sure there are people out there, unfortunately, working on just that kind of thing, uh, playing around, get its transmiss transmissibility up, get its lethality up, you know. Um, Hopefully, at the same time, you're working on a cure for it, because once you release that, you know, it's going to come back to bite you. <laughs> yeah, well, nobody's sure about COVID. I mean, there's still books being written on both sides of the issue, um, you know, advocating for the proposition that it was uh, just out of the wild, um, you know, transmitted by animals uh, uh, or other books uh, uh, that the Chinese actually created it and that laboratory and and uh, i suppose you could take either side of that question and um there are the rogue countries out there i'm afraid to say who would see any candidate for bioterrorism as something they should explore and develop uh i don't know why they would want to kill so many people but there are those countries that have have no guardrails on that sort of thing right and then there are non-state actors all around too yes thank you yeah. well, what's what's that worth you know What's that worth if you develop it and then you want to sell it to a, a state actor? Right. Um, could be any any price at all. Yeah. And, uh, um, and with, I mean, CRISPR technology, which you mentioned, which would likely be a, a bioterrorist, you know, first first choice, is increasingly cheap and available, and you know, just become really sort of cookbook now. Um, so it, it's easy to use. So, yeah, yeah, and, and the other thing about this is that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't, I don't live in the world of, of microbes, <laughs> but uh, um, so <laughs> viruses are very. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> My uh, viruses are very even tiny thing. They're really tiny particles, uh, you know, and they're they're all DNA and nothing much more. Um, but but the bacteria are bigger. And uh, right in general, I don't know how big this one is, but um, th this one would, would be an easier candidate because you can see it at less of a, 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 a telescopic um, um, uh, a telescopic um, magnitude. And, and so uh, maybe CRISPR is easier or some other kind of technology would be easier working on a bacteria? Yeah, well, bacteria are basically cells, similar to the cells that make all of us up. Uh, they have some differences. They have a cell wall instead of a cell membrane. They don't have a nucleus. 
but they're basically living cells. They're doing all the same kinds of things. They're taking in nutrients, they're processing them, they're excreting stuff out. They're living, basically. Viruses are a whole different thing. Viruses are on that really shaky line. Are they living or are they not? And a lot of people will say viruses are not living when they're not in people. Uh, they're, living or, they're living when they get into an organism and they're not living when they're not in an organism. Because when they're not in an organism, they're not doing anything. They're just a protein shell with, as you say, a bunch of genetic material stashed into it. And not, it's not respiring, it's not metabolizing, it's just sitting there, uh, showing none of the characteristics of life until it clamps onto a cell. And so yeah, viruses are a little trickier to deal with in some sense. We know more about bacteria. We know more about disrupting cells, really. Um, yeah, so. we've had 100 years of science uh, yeah. looking at bacteria from the early days of penicillin and the like. Um, we haven't had that much, yeah. that much time, much experience with virus, right? Uh, old Edward Jenner in smallpox, right? One of the pox viruses. I mean, he, he got very lucky. You know, he's a very observant, smart guy. He got very lucky. Uh, and found, you know, he realized that the, the dairy maids were not were not getting smallpox. And he thought that was very interesting because they, they would get a, a mild form of cowpox, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you you haven't mentioned Ignatz uh, Semmelweis. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. That was his name. 1880 or so in Europe, looking at bacteria, looking at sanitation, uh, you know, taking those first steps at trying to find a way to stop the growth of the bacteria. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, it seems to me that um, it, they're coming faster now. I, I would have expected a, a kind of uh, uh, a pause, if you will, after COVID, what you call it, COVID, SJ67, you know, I mean, they keep it coming with COVID, but but you would think after a while we get a hand on, on a very sophisticated vaccine that will deal with any, you know, any variation of COVID. We haven't got that yet, and I don't know exactly what, uh, you know, the drug companies are doing. But here's another challenge. And, you know, you know Ethan, we, we talked today about uh, this disease, Burkholria Sudamali. Um, Next time you look, there'll be another one and another one and another one. And we live in a world where they're going to pop up, right? Right. And we are steadily, because our populations, particularly in developing countries, are still expanding. They are intruding on woodlands, forests, jungles, where lots of other animals live. So this is, has been and will continue to be for the next decades. The big thing is we're going to be exposing people to viruses they haven't really seen before because they haven't been around these animals so much. But if, whether it's bats or civets or pangolins or, or whatever it may be, um, you know, they all carry their own load of special things and some small percentage of those can jump into us and, and be nasty. Um, so, so we're gonna see a lot more of those zoonotic diseases before we see fewer of them, unfortunately. Yeah, so, um, and, and, and talking about this, it's not really a zoonotic disease, Right. Because it right. doesn't jump from the animals to the humans. Right. But what we don't know, and maybe you have a handle on this, what we don't know is whether it jumps from one, one species of animal to another. Well, let me go further than that. Um, suppose, you know, you have very small animals, tiny animals, even bacteria themselves. And what this is, is an aberration of the bacteria. And it jumps from one bacterium to another bacterium. And you have a, a similar kind of low-level zoonotic experience happening below before you ever get to um, you know, the human species. And so I think you're right to suggest with some, uh, 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 some CRISPR technology, you could take this and make it into zoonotic that goes not only among animals, but from animals to humans. It's not that complicated. Yeah, I mean, that's it's precisely actually what the bacteria are constantly in a battle with viruses. Most of the viruses that are out there are, are, are attacking bacteria, basically. And um, mostly they're not interested in, in us. They're interested in bacteria and, and using bacteria to reproduce themselves. Uh, but yeah, um, we, we live in interesting times, Jay. We live in interesting times. Well, I mean, more than that, we live in interesting times that are likely to become more interesting. 
<laughs> Not necessarily in a good way. Yeah. So, yes, no. right. so you know what? What uh, you know? What could, what should the scientific community do about this? I mean, for example, I feel there's a pause. Um, you know, on COVID, uh, we're all. I went to New York a few weeks ago. Nobody, a very small percentage of people wearing masks. Huh? I went upstate to Connecticut, Massachusetts, and the like. Very few people wearing masks. We have we have come to this kind of, I don't know if people put it in these terms, like a herd immunity feeling that it's not so troubling anymore. Yeah. And if it's not so troubling anymore, then we're not going to worry about, um, you know, other such diseases that are happening and will happen and will continue to get worse, like Burkholderia Burkholder Sudamali. Um, and and the, the, the projection that we make, the, uh, you know, the the, the dynamic of these diseases and their interactivity with bigger cities and bigger populations, and of course, climate change changing everything around us, including us. Um, you know, I don't think we're paying enough attention, really? uh, either in the U.S. scientific community or uh, in the World Health Organization, to deal with the things that are coming down the pike. We're, we're, all, we're always retrospective about it. And that's not the way it should work, right? Right. No, it was nice to see the CDC has basically been fairly self-critical now and basically sort of said, hey, we, we blew this. We, we screwed up in a number of different ways. We see how we screw up. We're, we're going to change things around. So hopefully it won't happen again. But yeah. It's very well, the, the proof thing. there was that the, we found to our chagrin that the CDC was subject to political manipulation. I don't think there's any other way to look at it. Uh, and and hopefully that will not repeat. Hopefully their um, you know their their remarks a few days ago indicate they're not going to let that happen. Knock wood. Um, mm -hmm. But but even then you know you got to put more money in. You've mm -hmm. got to you got to train more people to be biochemists and water scientists. By the way, that too. Uh, <laughs> and you got to have it all over the world. You got to have a a global focus. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, that's it's all happy. Uh, oh, but, I, but before we go, I have to tell you a story. Right after this show, okay, we're doing our biweekly movie report. And we're reporting on a movie that, uh, that came out in 2019 called uh, Laundromat with Meryl Streep, Anthony, Anthony Banderas, and my favorite actor of all, Gary Oldman. Uh, Oldman. Um, and this is a movie about um, laundering money, and it's based on real situations and a real book and so forth. And, the, and it starts with, in the first part of it, first five minutes, it starts with um, an event that took, took place in, in Lake George, New York, uh, where um, Meryl Streep lost her husband when a boat capsized in Lake George. And you have to guess, you get one guess on this. You have to guess the name of that boat. If you haven't seen the movie, you should see the movie. But I'm going to tell you now, maybe nobody will be listening. The name of the boat that starts this movie, uh, Laundromat, very, very good movie, is the Ethan Allen. <laughs> that's, what, that's where he's from. That area. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would. Okay, we'll watch the movie, and next time we'll get together, we'll find some other really happy topic to talk about. <laughs> Sounds good, Jay. Take care. Thank you, Ethan. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.